I, I think we both want to thank FII for this event. Uh, I think this is the third time or so, and it's incredibly successful here at Miami. Larry, you really are one of the great prognosticators, and you actually move markets. And I just saw that you actually may not think that interest rates are going to go down. Why? I said last week that I thought there was a 15% chance that the next Fed move would be upwards. I said that because, one, I think the economy is looking relatively strong, that uh, if anything, there's a little bit of a sense of reacceleration re in the goods producing uh, sector, that uh, labor markets still appear relatively uh, tight, and that interest rates haven't had the bite that most people expected they would have, as evidenced by semi-euphoric financial conditions. So strength in the economy, one. Two, increasing evidence that inflation may be less down for the count than many people supposed. Owner-occupied housing, so-called owner-equivalent rent, looks to be likely to rise 3 to 4% this year if you look at what's happened to single-family housing. So-called supercore inflation. Take weird stuff out. Take food out. Take energy out. Take housing out. And you got something that's running well above two and faster for the last month than the last three, faster for the last three than the last uh, six. So you've got economic strength and elements of financial euphoria, the possibility of inflation not really uh, reaching target, and you got to say, like, what's the Fed going to do? And they're not going to raise rates now. They're not going to raise rates uh, next month, but they're not going to cut rates. Right now, markets don't think that the first cut is going to come until June. It's a long time between now and June. A lot of things could happen. And one of those is that the economy could stay strong and that inflation could look relatively robust. And they could decide that the right thing to do was to cool things off. So I think that, in general, one of the mistakes that people make in markets is they think in terms of modes. They ask themselves what they think the most likely scenario is. And that's a useful thing to do, but I think it's a more useful thing to ask about tails. And so, two or three months ago, when the market was pricing in six cuts during 2024, I asked myself how likely I thought 10 was and how likely I thought 2 was. And I could make a much more compelling narrative for 2, Eric, than I could for 10. And that led me to think that 6 was the wrong guess. And so right now, I think 4, which is what the market's pricing in, could well happen. But it's probably a little above the center of mass of what I would think. And I think you got to recognize that there's some tail probability that their next move is up. And I think that's something that needs to be handled with considerable delicacy, because I don't think, uh, despite my best efforts, that that risk is as yet much in markets. So I have two sort of follow-up-ish questions. One is that it, there's conventional wisdom that during an election year, where this certainly is, that the government always produces a looser money strategy because everyone wins with looser money, which is completely counter to what you just said. So if, if powerful forces in the government, and you've lived through this for decades, push for that, how will that get resolved? Loose money, tight money, political stakes are enormous. You know, Eric, it's an interesting thing. Economists have studied this a lot. And basically, what they've done is look at all the conventional relationships of monetary policy between the Fed funds rate and everything in the kitchen sink. 
and see whether there's any evidence that those relationships are different in years divisible by four. And it's surprisingly difficult to find any such uh, evidence. You know, does the so-called Taylor rule fit differently in election years? Are there more movements in the first half of the year relative to the second half of the year? Are rates lower? As a generalization, it's hard to make that uh, case and harder than I think most of the commentary uh, would, uh, would suggest. Second thing I'd say is it's, you know, it's complicated if you think about the psychology of the people who are there. If you walk into the Fed and you breathe the air, I guess air can't talk, but if it could, what that air would be saying to you is don't screw up like Arthur Burns and G. William Miller did. Don't screw up like they screwed up in the 1970s. And that is what is so deeply internalized. And the Fed gave a good run at screwing up that way in 2021. It's kind of remarkable to think that in the summer of 2021, the Fed said that it did not expect to lift rates above zero until 2024. The chairman of the Fed said, we're not even thinking about thinking about the possibility of uh, raising uh, rates. So having that broad culture and having made that mistake in such recent recovery, I think there is the dynamic you described, but there's another dynamic which is, let's be real careful, we don't wanna let inflation go. Again, I said, I didn't say that I expected that the next move would be up. I said that it was a mistake to completely discount the possibility that the next move would be up. That's what it means to talk about a 15% probability. So, so one final question on markets and globalization. The world's a mess, right? You've got two very significant wars. You have all of these problems. You have very large sets of issues in the global south. Prices have gone up because of the wars. There's enormous concerns over the role of China, the aligned countries, India trading on both sides, et cetera. Is this priced into the market? What do you think is going to happen? I think you've got geopolitical risk and you've got political risk. I've been a Democrat all my life. I'm always happier when Democrats win elections. I was certainly fervently hoping that Barack Obama would beat Mitt Romney, that John Kerry would beat um, George uh, W. Bush. But I never was adjusting my portfolio based on that or replanning my life or giving different advice to my children based on the results of uh, an election. I think the risks in this moment are really very substantially greater. You know, one of the really surprising, and in many ways, I think most ways, hugely positive features of the last 25 years in markets that really doesn't get much attention is if you look at the value of US companies compared to the value of companies headquartered all over the rest of the world, it has soared in the last 25 years. We are more than half of the market value of all the world's stock markets. That's a huge tribute to lots of things about American capitalism. It's, I think, uh, above all else, a reflection of the huge benefit from being the country where you can raise your first $100 million before you buy your first suit. But it has a lot of uh, strengths that we have. And one of the strengths is the rule of law, the sense that the rule of law is enforced in ways that don't depend on who the parties are. And that's something we sort of take for granted. 
but I think it's something that could be called into collect question in uh, the context of the next uh, election. You know, one of the clearest lessons of economic history is that over a period of a decade, populism is almost always bad for economic performance. Whether it's right-wing populism or whether it's left-wing uh, populism, populism damages economies, damaged economies damage markets, markets uh, look uh, forward. So I hope I'm wrong, but I think the risks of nationalist populist policy, both at home in terms of the rule of law, internationally in terms of protectionism and restrictions on flows of goods, flows of uh, capital, flows of uh, people, it, restrictions on the ability and willingness to engage in collective security arrangements. I think those are things that are very real risks. They're not my prediction, but they are very real risks and they seem to me to be insufficiently priced in uh, right now to assessments of uh, where markets are uh, going to uh, go. It's not that what's priced into markets is implausible. It's just that there's much more room to my mind for it to be wrong on the high side than there is for it to be wrong in at least some important respects on uh, the low side is uh, my sense. You know, Eric, you and I were both um, very close to uh, the late Henry Kissinger. And Henry had many fascinating complex and nuanced uh, beliefs. But I'm not sure any was more central than the idea of order and predictability yes. as a prerequisite for anything else good to happen. And the sense that nothing good would ever come from anarchist, anarchy, chaos, and complete unpredictability. And I think that the world is potentially headed into a period where there is less of a sense of what the order is going to be, and therefore more risk of disorder, chaos, and uh, the associated uh, suffering. And I'm not sure that kind of risk is fully priced in uh, to uh, markets. But of course, that's for every investor uh, to make uh, their own uh, judgment. Um, Henry could not have said it better, um, and we miss him. Um, you wanted to talk a little bit about AI. Eric, I, you've, been, you've written a book on it with uh, Henry. It's been a professional uh, preoccupation of yours for uh, many years. I'm... I'm someone who, when I think of AI, when I think of fusion energy, when I think of CRISPR and some of the revolutions in the life sciences, what I remind myself, and it's an antidote to some of the things we've been, that I've been saying, is that events are 75% bad, trends, are 75% good, 
the world is shaped at least as much by trends as it is by events, but we all tend to focus on events because they are events, they're what is in uh, the news. So I guess I'm interested in your sense of how do you see this uh, profound transformation? I, I kind of suspect that the synthetic intelligence is maybe the most fundamental of the revolutionary technological trends in this moment. And I'm just interested in how you see it in terms of how will historians look at it 100 years from now or 500 years from now? So I think that the arrival of a intelligence that's not human is a really big deal, right? It's sort of an alien intelligence. And it won't show up as a robot busy slaying the dragon and, you know, making coffee for you. It'll show up in other ways. And the arrival of a polymath, and polymaths are these enormously brilliant people who have shaped history over many times, um, that each of you, every one of us has our own polymath that helps us get through the day, is a major step change in intelligence and ability to get things done. So I'm going to claim without any proof whatsoever that AI will double everyone's productivity. You'll write as much code, you can write as many papers, you can sue as many people if you're a lawyer, you can treat twice as many people as a doctor, or maybe even more. And the arrival of this is heralded by a lot of questions, like who gets to make the decision, hopefully the humans. What happens when the computers start to be able to make their own decisions, which we think will be able to occur in three to five years? How do we handle all of these? Um, how do we as a society think about this new intelligence? Now, the way it will work is it'll be basically text to action. You'll have an idea and you'll say, I want a this, and the system will show you the recipe or organize the events. And the systems will be smart enough to be able to communicate, send emails, make phone calls, and so forth. They can also do evil things as well, unless we're careful. But the reason the hype is so insane, right? And thank God, Larry, that you and others made this capital market that allows for crazy people to raise billions of money with no product, no team, no revenue, and no idea what they're doing. So thank you very much, right? And by the way, they're going to go for another round and get twice as high and twice as high. I mean, the American capital market is allowing this. It's going to be invented in America, which is wonderful. That was pretty good. That was, um, I, that was pretty good. <laughs> well, I feel, I feel like I'm back in his where class. Do you, where do you think... It will be felt to the largest uh, extent. I have um, uttered the sentence, it's going to come for IQ before it comes for EQ. Yeah. Do you think that's right? <clears throat> or do you think it's going to be so good at, you know, as I've read about some of the systems that can provide conversation for the lonely and empathy for the unhappy, I've slightly uh, wondered um, about whether I was right when I said it's going to come for IQ uh, before uh, EQ. Is it going to replace those who do the most creative intellectual work, um, or is it going to replace those who are more in the mode of, perf of doing more routine uh, performance? Another thing that I have said about all this is that um, the first stage of any new technology is about how it's going to do tasks of which we've previously conceived better. And the second and much more fundamental stage 
is when it does tasks of which we have not previously conceived. So, you know, to take a trivial example, the first movies, first movie cameras were used, or video cameras were used to be placed at the back of theaters and to take films of plays. And then people sort of figured out you could do something much more interesting uh, than that. If you had a uh, video camera, say something about the, I mean, a lot of the discussions like yours are about how this is gonna change everything, it's gonna be non-human intelligence, everything's gonna be different. Say something about, and I'm not disagreeing with any of that, but say something about some of the places where it's gonna be more different sooner and some of the places where it's gonna be less different sooner. So um, the presumption is everything has changed but not in, this, in the same order. And historically, and you know this because you study this very carefully, automation tends to replace the most dangerous and poorest jobs. I think there's every reason to believe that that will still be true. You and I have talked about the question of what to do with all the jobs that are displaced where there's no obvious new job, right? A typical example is why are security guards human? Shouldn't security guards be some equivalent of a robot because they don't need to sleep, they don't get drunk, you don't have to pay them that much, that kind of stuff. So there's all sorts of functions that are relatively easy to understand that are relatively automatable. Another example would be, um, let's think about lawyers. The, the paralegal brief, LLMs can do that today. Programmers, um, there are sometimes programming teams where they have a very smart set of programmers and then people who sort of fill in, do testing. The latter part will all be automated. Over checking things, all of the things which are kind of second order effects, those jobs are affected very dramatically and very quickly in my opinion. The question that academics and executives always want to know is, when does it come for me? And the answer is, last, but not never, right? So we, there's a long-term question of the arrival of this kind of intelligence, but not for a long time. One thing I would say for the audience is that I go to a lot of events where people say, well, a computer will never be able to write something with the human experience and the evocativeness that humans can write. That's just false. Right? These systems can actually read what a million people felt and produce something as good as the great humans can. So remember that the systems are looking at human experiences and they're generalizing in a way that we as individuals, no matter as smart as you are, cannot do. And I think we should move to questions from the audience uh, on, I think, on anything. Uh, who would like to get started? I think we should, and we've got a couple here that I saw earlier on. From the Saudi Business Council, I spotted Jeffrey here. Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, Jeff Steiner from Canada. Uh, Dr. Summers, uh, the title is about a stronger global economy, and I just wanted to ask you about interdependencies of the economies, all this decoupling that's been talked about, maybe not the US dollar as the reserve currency. Can the global economy grow if America's growing well but China isn't, or does Chinese growth and European growth contribute to US? U.S. economic growth and global growth? I think there's no question that it's closer to right to say that more growth somewhere contributes to growth elsewhere than it is to say that growth somewhere comes at the expense of growth elsewhere. It's more right to say that the global economy is a positive sum game than it is to say that it's a uh, zero sum or a negative sum game. That said, I think it would be a mistake to think that our growth depends upon there being great prosperity and success in other parts of the world. That substantial parts of the US economy are internal to uh, the uh, US uh, economy. And so while I think we will grow more successfully if China grows more rapidly, I think that if you asked me for an estimate of the partial elasticity of US growth with respect to Chinese growth, 
it would probably be in the high single digits of basis points. That is, if China's growth rate goes down by uh, two percentage, by one percentage point, I'd expect U.S. growth, other things equal to perhaps decline by eight one hundredths of a percentage uh, point. So the effect is there, but I don't think that uh, the effect is immense. That would be less true when you were talking about small countries with very big neighbors. If you ask me what the impact of France's growth rate was on Monaco, I would obviously give a much larger number. But for a large economy like uh, the United States, those effects are there, but I don't think the effects are um, immense. Um, look, we are 10 times, roughly speaking, take a Canadian economic number, and if you want to think about the equivalent American number, uh, think about uh, multiply by 10. And so given that um, one oper fluctuations in one operating on 10 are much, much less important than fluctuations on 10 operating on one. So if you gave me a lot of questions I could ask to make a US economic forecast, it would take a long, long, long time before I'd get to how's the Canadian economy doing. On the other hand, if you ask me for a Canadian economic forecast, how's the US economy gonna do next year would be one of my first five questions. Yes, well, ma'am. I'm afraid our great efforts to actually, and please forgive me, involve our audience here. Uh, it's not going to work on this one because we've got to wrap it up for this time. So I'm terribly sorry about this. We're so grateful that you've taken your time. You just wrap up maybe a quick word of wisdom from both of you. Uh, we will have a tech session coming up, AI, AI, with a list of very, very impressive experts coming up. So get your questions ready for that because I'll make sure everybody so, has plenty of time. So Back to you to wrap it so, up. Thank so, you. so let me, you know, I've worked with Larry for 30 years. You've serve the government in incredible ways. I look forward for you to serve it again soon. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>